Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Indiana University Alumni Association, linking IU's network of over 650,000 alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships and volunteer opportunities. Alumni.iu.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Just as they were preparing to lose their jobs, some Orange County workers find out they'll be sticking around. They shouldn't have any downtime whatsoever. At least that's what I've heard. We'll tell you about a buyer's plans to keep a large manufacturing facility open. It's back to work for Indiana's state legislators. I think we will find places that will be common ground. I think we'll find places during this short session where we'll find issues where we must work together. We'll talk to State House reporter Brandon Smith about what to expect over the next 10 weeks. And a bittersweet goodbye as more than 200 members of Indiana's National Guard head to Kuwait. I know that when the uniform member takes that call, it's the loved ones who are serving and sacrificing just as much. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. A furniture factory in Orleans that was slated for closure next month has a buyer. That means more than 100 people who work at the plant won't lose their jobs and the factory will stay open. It's a story we first brought you late last year when community members said they were hoping for a Christmas miracle. Tyler Lake has this update. Orange County needed some good news. The area has been losing skilled jobs at an unprecedented pace. Unemployment here was the highest in the state last year. The Paley Incorporated Manufacturing Facility is the only large manufacturing plant in the area. For us, it was not simply just a real estate transaction, but it was a community transaction. H&I, the company that owned Paley Incorporated, gave the more than a million square foot facility to the County Economic Development Partnership. Development officials reached a deal last week with Jasper Seating Incorporated to buy the facility. This region is so rich in wood manufacturing, so I think it's, it's important to keep that and to keep that skill set moving here in the area. Once Jasper Seating acquires the building, it will be its largest facility. The Paley Furniture brand is going away, but other than that, Weisensteiner says the employees shouldn't notice much of a change. They shouldn't have any downtime whatsoever, at least that's what I've heard. Um, and then they'll amp up some production with hopefully hiring additional employees the end of um, next year and then moving forward as well. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. Representatives from the Jasper Group say they hope to add more workers as early as the first quarter of 2018. Indiana lawmakers are back to work. The 2018 legislative session kicked off this week. There's no single issue that's expected to dominate the session, but there are a number of contentious topics that have already come up. State House reporter Brandon Smith joins us. Brandon, I know you're busy. Let's start with the Department of Child Services. In her resignation letter last month, former DCS Director Mary Beth Bonaventura warned of dire consequences if the department doesn't make major changes. This prompted Governor Eric Holcomb to have an independent consultant examined the agency. Now House Speaker Brian Bosma says the issue needs addressed. We literally have more than double the children in our, in our child welfare system using the same definition than Ohio and Illinois combined. We spend more money on child welfare than Ohio and Illinois combined. 
So, Brandon, there seems to be a lot of political will here. What do you see happening with DCS this session? Honestly, not very much. Uh, Republican leaders in the House and Senate say they want to let the expert consultants do their work and that they don't think the process would be well served by legislative hearings and investigations. Now, GOP leaders have promised to an, a full review of the consultant's report once it's finished, but that isn't likely until after session is over. And what about cold beer sales? Certainly not a new issue, but one that seemed to come to head during last year's session because of the loophole Rickers found that allowed it to sell cold beer. And State Senator Philip Boots has already introduced a bill to allow the sale of cold beer at grocery and convenience stores. So do you get the sense any of these bills will advance or what hurdles might they face? Well, cold beer expansion faces, frankly, an uphill battle. There is consensus growing around legalized Sunday alcohol sales. That was the big recommendation that came out of the Summer Study Commission on this. But cold beer expansion th faces a lot more opposition, particularly some people who feel like expanding that into grocery stores and convenience stores would increase overconsumption, increase underage drinking. So at this point, I'd call it a long shot. Let's talk about the opioid epidemic. The legislature passed several measures last year aimed at addressing the problem. Still, it got worse. House Minority Leader Terry Gooden is from Austin, Indiana, one of the places hardest hit by the epidemic. For those who have seen their communities destroyed by drugs, a battle I've witnessed firsthand, I will say we will do everything in our power to make sure officials have the tools they need to fight this disaster. So, Brandon, with support from Governor Holcomb and legislators, what are they looking at doing to stem the tide of opioids in the state? Well, when House Republicans unveiled their caucus's agenda this week, it included a measure that will help create nine new drug treatment centers around the state. That followed Governor Eric Holcomb's promise that no Hoosier should have to drive more than an hour to one of these centers. So that's the nine new centers. They will also push, push legislation that will streamline licensing for mental health and addiction treatment professionals. Cannabidiol has also been a hot button issue in the state this year. One state senator has already filed a bill that would make CBD available to more Hoosiers. Representative Jim Lucas is on a crusade to legalize the substance. And the more I learned about medical cannabis, the more I kept asking myself, why isn't Indiana doing this? Why aren't we one of the 29 states that don't criminalize their citizens for seeking a better quality of life? So what's legal under the current CBD law varies depending on who you ask. Brandon, is there a sense among lawmakers that they need to clarify the law or just make CBD available to everyone? Well, I think there's a lot more willingness to clarify the CBD law, but we heard something new from House Speaker Brian Bosma this week, which is that he's starting to think that CBD should be available to everyone as long as it doesn't contain any THC, which was the primary psychoactive ingredient in cannabis. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you, Joe. Before we shift gears, another House Democrat has decided not to seek re-election. Linda Lawson has represented Hammond for 20 years. She's the number two ranking House Democrat. She says the legislature has become toxic with Republicans holding large majorities. Lawson's decision comes, up, comes after Representative Scott Peloth of Michigan City stepped down as House Minority Leader in November. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana University Health is selling the Bloomington Hospital property to the city at a steep discount. But as Sophia Salovey reports, there are no plans for the site once the old hospital is demolished. This week's announcement comes after years of uncertainty about the future of the West 2nd Street property. A letter of intent specifies the city will pay $6.5 million for the property and a few surrounding parcels. The property is worth almost $10 million more than that. IU Health Bloomington will use the funds for its new hospital along State Road 4546. IU Health will spend up to $8 million to demolish, remediate, and transfer the property to the city. That won't be until 2020. Mayor John Hamilton says while the future of the site is uncertain, the city has time to find a solution. By making this agreement at this time, our community has the advantage of time to study various options, gather more public input, and plan for the next use of this clean site. 
A hospital site reutilization steering committee has been working in groups for several years to determine the best viable options for the space. Jack Baker was a member of that committee under Hamilton's predecessor, Mayor Mark Cruzan. He says demolishing the hospital instead of converting it is easier. It's old. Um, the facilities there uh, have got a lot of use on them, and while they're in good shape and they're being maintained, uh, the fact is that they're, they're pretty old. The City of Bloomington and IU Health Bloomington will enter into a binding purchase agreement no later than February 15th. After that, the city will work with the national nonprofit, the Urban Land Institute, to gather recommendations and public input about future uses of the hospital property. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. The deer call at Bloomington's Griffey Lake Nature Preserve is over. Sharpshooters killed 62 deer. City Parks officials say overpopulation of deer at the preserve has reduced the size and quantity of many plant species. The city plans to monitor the plants to assess the effectiveness of the coal. The city donated the venison to the Hoosier Hills Food Bank. Getting from one side of Paoli to the other is a little easier now that a historic bridge is back open. It took roughly $750,000 in more than two years for the structure to be repaired. Christmas Day 2015 is one many Paoli residents won't forget. I heard it from some of my friends, so I drove down here, and when I looked at it, I said, oh my God. How could a semi go over that? A woman drove a 30-ton semi over a bridge with a six-ton weight limit, nearly destroying the centuries-old structure. We were concerned the day this occurred two, two years and nine days ago uh, that this bridge would never be able to be restored because it was in horrible shape. The bridge dates back to the late 1800s and is a focal point in the community. So residents were more than ready to see it rededicated and reopened this week. It's amazing that we're getting it opened back up so we can drive back over it. It's now known as the Saul Strauss James Tucker Memorial Bridge, named after two local philanthropists. And there are special barriers to help protect the structure from future damage. It's the same height as the top of the bridge here. So to get on this bridge again and destroy it with a semi-truck, you've got to knock those signs down first. After the inaugural car made its trip over the bridge, it officially reopened to traffic. A health care program developed by Indiana University researchers has reduced avoidable hospitalizations of long-stay nursing facility residents by 33 percent. The program placed nurse pr practitioners in 19 nursing homes. Rather than having to divide their time, they focus solely on supporting long-term residents. Anytime we can avoid that and care for that person safely in the environment that they know and are comfortable with, with staff that they know, is something we should strive for. UNRO says the program's initial success has opened the doors for expanding its nursing facilities beyond Indiana. And Joe, that's certainly some research to watch as they continue to implement those Ab changes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Esports or competitive video gaming is a growing trend, and some students want to bring it to the collegiate level. Hundreds of Indiana troops are headed to Kuwait in one of the largest deployments in state history. It was an emotional send-off. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk.
The competitive video game industry, known as eSports, is booming. The global market will top a billion dollars in the next couple years. Lindsay Wright visited a couple of teams to see how it works, and she joins us now. Thanks, Joe. As eSports continues to surpass growth projections, colleges are wrestling with how to treat it. Is it a varsity sport? Should players of the online game be eligible for scholarships? Some schools are jumping on board, while others are holding off. This isn't your typical sports team. This is an eSports team. Indiana Tech added the varsity program at the beginning of this school year and is even offering partial scholarships to recruits. We have several students from uh, California, some from Texas, you know, I'm from Georgia. It's kind of, it's a melting pot because it is so new. A lot of people are jumping on this opportunity as it becomes like a new phase in sports at college level. Most of the players focus on a game called League of Legends. Player Logan Fisher explains it as simply as he can. You take 10 people, five on each team, whoever knocks down the other person's base first wins. Their fingers move at high speeds. For sophomore Daniel Kellogg, that comes rather easy. I played a lot of piano back in the day, so my, my fingers can naturally move that way. But learning new moves takes practice, just like any other sport. Let's say I gotta press this key and that key at the same time, mm -hmm. right? It takes about uh, three months to get used to because you naturally want to do something else, like flex your fingers differently. And so it takes about three months to get out of that wiring your brain into something new, something healthier, something yeah. better, so you can react faster. Competitive gaming is spreading like wildfire, especially at the collegiate level. Reports project it'll be a $1.5 billion industry by the year 2020. The National Association of Collegiate Esports has grown from overseeing seven varsity teams to 53 in just a year and a half. And these schools are, are all different sizes, different types. Some of them are, uh, you know, huge state programs. Some of them are small private schools. Some of them are, are schools that have never had an athletics program at all. Despite the growing popularity, Brooks describes esports as the wild, wild west. It's a broad activity, and he says it's difficult to organize. Change is coming, but slowly. It's really elevating collegiate competition from what the club level is, which is, you know, it could be a group of five friends who get together and form a team uh, and, and compete on behalf of their school, to really looking at an organized and resourced group to compete at the highest level for their institution. He says as more institutions get on board, naturally, more resources follow. But he says one of the big snags teams face is administrators. Dragon, dragon, dragon. Just back up, back up. That's the challenge the Indiana University Gaming Club in Bloomington is up against. The group practices once or twice a week, usually at home. They don't have a dedicated place to play. They play against other Midwestern schools. Right now, the team is meeting for the first time to review a match they recently played against Purdue. It's just like reviewing film from a football game. A lot of these players received a small scholarship last year through a Big Ten tournament. But Coach John Mundell says having IU's support would be a game changer. Seeing things that can make like the quality of life, I guess, for the players to be a lot easier uh, or helping us like do whatever we need to do, like giving us funding to go to tournaments. Mundell says he doesn't expect the kind of resources Indiana Tech has at this point, he'd just like administrators to be more open to a conversation about esports. The future looks promising. Industry leaders like Indiana Tech's head coach say the growth speaks for itself. Well, did you see the Warriors play? Who'd they play? Well, they played League of Legends and played against, you know, Ohio State University. Like, it's, it's just going to be a very typical thing within the next five years for sure. The NACE projects nearly 70 more schools will become member institutions with varsity teams by this summer. But Joe, officials th say they've undershot those projections each month, so wow. there could be even more. I'm always amazed how advanced those graphics come every yeah. year, too. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Lindsay. You're welcome. Indiana University is participating in the largest ever research project on concussions in sports. It aims to address how they occur and their long-term implications. The NCAA and the Department of Defense are funding the research at IU and nearly 30 other universities across the country. As Barbara Brozier reports, the research tracks a group that's often overlooked when it comes to concussions. IU! 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 
Cheerleading's been a passion of Abigail Cohen since she was in seventh grade. I love being a part of the school. I love cheering games. I love doing pep rallies. She's a member of Indiana University's Cream Squad, where you can see her flying high at football and basketball games. But she thinks about stunts differently after what she experienced over the summer. I just had a really bad headache. And that sometimes happens when you hit your head, but then I waited it out a little bit. And you know, a few hours later, I still had a really bad headache. I woke up with a headache and then I you know, went in and took the test. Cohen went in for concussion testing. And because she's an athlete at IU, trainers had a baseline test to compare her results to. The university is participating in the Concussion Assessment, Research and Education Consortium, a national project that tracks the effects of concussions over time. As part of the research, student athletes undergo an initial neurocognitive assessment. So the neurocognitive, cognitive assessments, postural, all are performed at the baseline, so before the first um, contact or first official practice, if you will, and then as soon as a student athlete sustains a concussion, we follow up with all of the same assessments immediately. The university also follows up with athletes at five predetermined points during their time at IU and plans to track them for several years after graduation. The focus isn't just on the physical impact of concussions, but also the psychological. And the research involves all student athletes, including women. That's a group that's often excluded from studies and the national debate about concussion safety. With um, cheerleading specifically, we're gathering some data that, you know, some people may not think, you know, hey, concussions can happen in the sport just because of the impact of, if they're, you know, with the stunting. Pretty much exactly, exactly it. It's a brand new field from a research standpoint. There was very little research that was happening before, say, 2000, certainly to 2005. And then as public awareness became much greater on the topic, we realized that there was a, a real need for further research. Researchers hope to gain a better understanding of how concussions can affect athletes' physical and mental health long term. The project could have a significant impact, not just on approaches taken with college sports, but also on those playing at the youth and professional levels. I think this will allow us to have better tools for diagnosing concussions, better tools for managing concussions. It allows us to create the next set of um, sport-related concussion guidelines. Cohen says being part of the study made her feel more comfortable when it came time to return to practice following her concussion. The testing helped her coach know when she was truly ready. She's fine now, but her experience changed her mindset when it comes to safety. We're definitely more cautious. All the boys on my team know that you know, once you've had a concussion once, you really don't want to have another one. So they all, um, when we do try new stunts, we are very cautious about if people are around spotting and um, just especially, you know, to protect the head when you fall. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Rozier. Hundreds of Indiana National Guardsmen are on their way to the Middle East. As Lindsay Wright reports, officials and family members gathered this week for a send-off ceremony. And the rockets are red glare, the bombs bursting in 250 Indiana National Guard soldiers are heading overseas. They'll assist with missions throughout Southwest Asia, which includes Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Iran, Turkey, and Syria. Loved ones took pictures and prayed during Tuesday's send-off at the Kokomo Event Center. U.S. Senators Todd Young and Joe Donnelly offered words of support to the troops and their families. You spent so much time preparing for this, so much time away from family and friends. But you're prepared to meet and defeat the challenges of this dangerous 21st century world. When I came in, I saw a young boy who had a T-shirt on, and it said, my mom is my hero. And that's what all of you are to us in this state. The deployment is scheduled for nine to 10 months, so officials say they'll be back in time to enjoy the holidays with their families. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. The unit will travel to Fort Hood in Texas for post-mobilization training before deploying overseas. Bloomington Utilities officials have received more than 100 calls about frozen or broken pipes in the past week. James Vavrick followed a plumber who's having trouble keeping up. 
Neil Patzner is the owner of Riverway Plumbing in Bloomington. It's before noon and he's on his sixth repair of the day. The problem in each case has been the same, a leak caused by a frozen pipe. Usually the day wakes up with the first person that gets up at 4 a.m. realizes they can't take a shower, um, they have no water. While the cold weather is good for business, Patzner says it's difficult when you see the devastation it can cause. Some of these people cry and you know knowing that you know they got a big debt or big problem with a lot of things busted and water roll over the house. And Patzner says if you keep your heat around 60, that should prevent your pipes from freezing. And for homes with older plumbing systems, it helps to leave the faucets dripping. For Indiana News Desk, I'm James Vavrick. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. We leave you now with the IU men's hockey team practicing outside. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Indiana University Alumni Association, linking IU's network of over 650,000 alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships and volunteer opportunities. Alumni.iu.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.